Uh, we're very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Mr. George Mahango uh, to the Osaka School of International Public Policy. Uh, he's coming to us from Muzuzu University uh, in Malawi, and uh, we're very happy to have him here to share some of his thoughts on peace and security in the Southern African region. Good morning, George, and, and welcome. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to speak with you about uh, issues concerning peace and security in the Southern African region. Um, I'd like to first start by, by asking for your thoughts on the, the relationship between security of the state and security of, of the people. Um, because I think throughout the Southern African region we, we have seen uh, through the years this situation in which the security of the government, uh, the security of the state apparatus, the party, the leader, uh, seem to take precedence over the security and well-being of, of, of the people that comprise uh, these countries and the region. Um, what would be your thoughts on that statement? Well, um, my, my first reaction would be that uh, I think it's true that to a certain extent the state uh, has been the primary referent you know, um, of security in Southern Africa. But of course there is a growing realization that uh, this was a miss. Um, there is a feeling that I think we have to invest so much into the security of the people. Um, we have seen a lot of um, efforts being made to that effect, uh, at least at the policy level, um, a commitment is there. But of course the challenge still remains with the practice, how we, we, we can achieve that kind of um, security of the people. Um, I think it still remains with the states. I see it happening within the states and not necessarily coming out of um, the efforts of the regional organization, in this case like SADC. But I think states have got a responsibility to create a space uh, where citizens can claim, you know, um, uh, can claim their security and they can demand their security from the state is, as well. Um, in this case, I'm looking at uh, human security being both ways where the state can provide it to a certain extent, but also the, the, the citizens themselves can claim it. And so it's high time really we invested in the security of the people and ensure that at least there is freedom from fear and freedom from want. Go okay, back. well maybe I could just interrupt you there. Um, the states themselves, I suppose, do not necessarily have an interest in enhancing human security if it is going to reduce the amount of power that they, they hold. Um, so I mean, I guess how do we overcome this, this kind of gap? We have a very state-oriented uh, government apparatus and uh, we have uh, uh, people who perhaps will be seeking, as you say, to, to, to demand for, for their security and well-being to be met. How do we, how do we balance the two? Of course, I think it's, it's important that we, we, we do not underestimate the power of citizenship. Um, I think through the development activities that are being done in most of these countries, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, programs that are building the citizenship of the people. And I think one of them is this rights-based approach to development, which builds, I think, in the co communities and the population, uh, the, the culture of demanding. And that is an active type of citizenship that will begin to reflect, of course, also in such uh, elements like um, uh, demanding for security and quality, you know, uh, living environments. So, yes, whilst we, we are coming from a background of a state-centric approach to security, but um, it can be broken, it can be challenged. It needs a gradual process and a consistent process of um, uh, active citizenship where we build a culture uh, of making the state uh, respond to our demands. That's the only way I'm seeing that we can make progress. Otherwise, I think we, we, we may be uh, buried in a, in, a, in a complaining environment where we just look at the state and we keep on you know, uh, uh, smearing or throwing mud at it and without necessarily coming up with alternatives. But I, I'm looking at uh, in an environment where we are able to build, you know, uh, 
the citizenship of the people, their right uh, to claim uh, from the state. And I think it will arise from that. Does this kind of civil awareness, or de perhaps we could call it democratic awareness, does this come from the schools? Does it come from the universities? Does it come from the parents? Where does it come from? I think from so many places. Um, the, the schools, in, in, in that case, the schools have got a responsibility. Um, um, but also, I'm looking at advocacy. Already, there's a lot of advocacy that is going channeled through the development works uh, that are being d done in the context of decentralization and things like that, service delivery. And so, if we can harness all those and do not take them as project outcomes or project processes that that end with the, 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 the phasing out of a project. But if we take them as skills that we, 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 we acquire in the process, um, uh, and then they can help us in uh, achieving radical possibilities, then there's, a, there's all, the, all that prospect that we can move uh, significantly towards an environment where we are able to begin to claim to the state. Because I think the state needs to be given a bit of a pressure as well. Um, it's a way of reminding the state that it has got a responsibility. Now, if the state doesn't feel like it has got a responsibility, I think the people have to make it feel that, this, yes, we have a responsibility, you know, uh, to take care of the population. And so that has to come from the people. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's more or less what I think is going to, to, to help have kind of a demand-driven um, uh, approach and not just a supply driven approach uh, where, where, where the state thinks uh, this is the security that the people want but then the people should tell, tell the state this is the security we want um, I think that's the way that's the way we should go okay, Now I'd like to, to talk about um, the impact of the Arab Spring um, of course we've seen very dynamic very major changes happening in Northern Africa uh, because of the Arab Spring, but uh, um, we are also keenly aware that the impacts have been felt in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Africa mm. as well. Um, and maybe this is related in some ways of this kind of grassroots rising up, this demanding for change, demanding for uh, an, an improvement uh, in the way things are. Mm. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the, the impact of the Arab Spring on, on, on the Southern African region? Yeah, I think, I think your, your observation is correct. Uh, we cannot underestimate the, the effect of the Arab Spring. Because I, if I may recall, uh, when the Arab Spring started, uh, we saw uh, pockets um, of also active citizenship in Senegal and Malawi. And I think they took place at the same time. Um, and later on, we also saw other areas um, or other countries coming in, like Swaziland. Um, I, think, I think what has happened is just an opening up of a political space for the civil society. And the message has been sent all over the world. I think what remains is for the civil society to tap, tap into it and begin to use it and begin to claim. And so, I think I think it's a it's a good development. It needs to be supported, and I think the civil society has to grab on the opportunity. Um, would you say that the um, the change of power, the change of uh, government in in Zambia in two thousand eleven, would you say that this would be that the impacts of the Arab Spring uh, could be connected in some way to this? I know, I know there was already a, a movement for change, maybe. The conclusion was already there before the Arab Spring, maybe. Mm. But would you say that this uh, was part of an encouragement, uh, part of a, a factor that affected the outcome of those elections? Um, could be yes and no. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, in the sense that I think the climate and the atmosphere has already been created. And I think there is this pressure and there's this movement and in almost every country, the civil society is kind of jacked up. And they're looking for even the slightest opportunity for them to uh, affect policy and influence the, the, the processes of politics. So in, the, in that sense, we could say yes, that there was that impact and that influence. But then we can also uh, not uh, overlook 
uh, the impact of other factors. I think the socioeconomic landscape of Zambia itself, um, the fact that at least about 60% of the Zambians live in the urban areas and uh, because of the, 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 the exposure they have to information and so on and so forth, that made them to uh, be able to judge in a more informed manner. Of course, thanks to the civil society that they were able to engineer or to support, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, change in government. Yeah, but maybe uh, a bit different from that. I am looking at maybe developments in in South Africa, like the Marikana. Mm. Uh, much as they've been a bit violent, but then you can see that this is also a way of sending a message to the government that I think enough is not being done. So my impression is that, you know, with this opening of this political space, um, whether trade unions or, or other civil society organizations will find every slightest crack to create space and advance an agenda. And this is something that the government should be aware of. This is what governments in Southern Africa should be aware of. And this puts them at least on the spot. And they should be ready to respond. But not just respond. There are certain issues that they can actually deal with even before they come to a crisis. Because actually the, the, the early warning will show that some aspects of the political environment are, are actually being challenged and they are going towards a crisis and then they should respond. Um, but I would say that Marikana to a certain extent can be can be thought of as also um, a response that has been motivated by the Arab Spring. Mm. How about uh, other places like Angola, like mm. Swaziland, mm. like Zimbabwe, where we certainly saw movements mm. seem to come up, um, mm. especially perhaps in, in Angola, which is certainly not accustomed to those sorts of mm. demonstrations. Mm. Uh, but they seem to have subsided. Mm. Do you think uh, it has sparked something that is mm. irreversible, or do you think it has just simply risen and, and, and fallen? Do you see any changes in these, in these areas? Uh, I would say it's too early. Mm -hmm. for us to judge whether they have uh, died uh, or, or, or they, they were just pockets of um, excited civil society uh, just trying to, to replicate what, what they thought they would replicate and then they failed. But I think my, 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 my take is that it, it, was, it was their way of testing, mm -hmm. you know, the system. Mm -hmm. Testing, testing the resilience of the system and seeing how much uh, effort they can put into the process. Mm. Um, and if we take it that way, then we, we can expect that in future they will begin to make more serious demands. And those are going to have probably an effect on the way the state responds to the needs of the people. Because I think the underlying factor is not necessarily whether they have, uh, there are demonstrations or protests or whatsoever, but the thing is, I think the civil society should be able um, to make uh, its voice heard, mm. and the state should be able to listen. Mm. And that's, that's, that's what I think is going to be uh, helpful in the process. Um, one area that is of interest to me in particular is the, the news media mm. uh, and the role of the news media in dealing with the sorts of issues that we've been talking about. Um, democratic consolidation, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and one thing that we find throughout the world, um, and and I think Southern Africa is no exception, is that we have news media that is very, very limited by national boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are there is foreign news. There is a there are world news paper, pages in the newspaper. Um, there is a, opportunities for world news to be seen, but at the same time. Um, the vast majority of news is dominated by domestic concerns. And, and I wonder about the impact this has on uh, perhaps a, a broader outlook on the world, of course, but more specifically the region, the region of Southern Africa. Is there something, I, I think there may be more space for the news media to, to, to create a more dynamic interaction throughout 
the community, whether it's through in, in the civil society or, or in the, the, the corridors of power as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that? The news media, I think, is crucial when it comes to the question of regional integration. Um, unfortunately, in Southern Africa, we, we have national newspapers and not international newspapers. I mean, like the, the, the focus of our newspapers is national. Ironically, there is a regional um, network of um, journalists in Southern Africa, which is called, I think, Media Institute of Southern Africa. MISA, yeah. Yeah, MISA. Mm -hmm. my, expect, my first expectation was that possibly it, it should be able to set an agenda mm. and challenge, you know, the national media houses to report or to, to document information that relates to the region. Mm. Because we need to know what is happening. For instance, when I'm in Malawi, I don't know what is happening in Zambia, unless I read a Zambia newspaper, which is very hard to come by. Mm. Okay. And, and so, in a way, we have nationalized our papers, but we have left the region to suffer. Mm. And the only time you read um, something about the region is possibly when there's a, a summit, a SADC summit. That's when you know, okay, SADC exists. And then you know you get uh, abreast of some of the developments that have taken place mm. in SADC. So I think it's it's a challenge. You know, it's a weakness in the media strategy that we have for the region. Mm. And ironically, also SADC has got a media um, and communication strategy mm. and a whole media unit, mm. okay, or communications unit. And I think this is a unit that should pick on. Um, some of these issues because it has got national focal points mm. in almost all the, in fact, in all these 14 countries. Mm. And so we should, be, the structures and the, and the processes that should initiate this kind of interaction are there. Mm. But I think they have not been used for the purpose. Mm. I mean, SADC can challenge the national governments and tell them there's nothing being, report, being reported about SADC. Mm. So I think there's a role that SADC can play but also there's a role that the governments can play. Mm -hmm. um, at least if, they, if, if the private media houses are not ready to report on SADC, at least we should expect that the national media houses mm -hmm. should do. Mm -hmm. Although maybe we could say, well, the private media houses don't have a financial interest in going beyond their borders, and sure. then the, the state-run media also don't have an interest in talking about what is beyond their jurisdiction, perhaps, I wonder. But then, that's, that's, that's where I'm saying that we are defeating the whole idea of regionalism. Because if we are committed to regionalism as, um, as, as a collective in SADC, then we should begin to support the processes mm -hmm. of regionalism. And in as far as communication is concerned, then the national media houses should be at the center of informing the people about what SADC is. Mm -hmm. you know? um, People should not know SADC just because there is a summit in their country mm -hmm. or, or because their head of state is going for a summit somewhere. But they should know SADC because it's their regional organization. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, in Europe, people know, or the, the Europeans know uh, EU because it is there. It is talked about. You know? But we rarely hear about AU. Mm -hmm. We rarely hear about SADC. Mm -hmm. Yet we have the institutions that should be able to tell us what SADC is all about. So to me, I just feel like it's a lost opportunity. Mm -hmm. Of course, we haven't lost everything entirely. We can regain some of these things when we just begin to do what is supposed to be done. These structures have to be revamped. I think one of the challenges that I see with the, the way SADC has been configured is that uh, um, states have not committed themselves to supporting the structures. Because the structures have been put in place. There are national focal points for almost every crucial activity that concerns regionalism in SADC. But then the question is whether the national focal points are able to do what they're supposed to do, or whether they are their governments mm -hmm. support them mm -hmm. if, uh, with resources to, 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 to actually do their job. So if we are really committed to regionalism, I think we should be able to resuscitate these structures. Mm -hmm. We don't have to establish them again, we just have to resuscitate them, mm -hmm. for the, I, because I know that they are there and they just have to be made operational. And then 
possibly we may be able to see in future um, uh, these national media houses reporting on issues that are beyond their borders. We should not know about Tanzania because there is a border issue between Malawi and Tanzania. Mm -hmm. But we should know we should know those key aspects of the uh, of of development or security in in that country that pertain to regionalism because it, it gives us an idea of how much we are integrating or we are cooperating. Um, so that that's that's I think a crucial area uh, that informs our efforts towards peace and security in Southern Africa. Thank you. You're welcome.